And this is some work with David Skinner and Lionel Mason, and also some older work with uh, Julia, and also, I should say, also some work in progress. And what we've been interested in is uh, looking at different representations of world heat models for field theory. So these world heat models have been really useful and driven a lot of recent advances, for example, to go beyond uh, flat space times. And we also know that they're underpinning uh, some of the most compact am amplitudes formula that we have. Now, there's two things that all of these have in common, as far as we know. So all of them, if they describe field theory, are chiral. And all of them have as the target space and the twister space, which is just the space of null geodesics. And so the most well known of these are the one that you, well, that's, <laughs> that's a big claim, but one that, you, that was already mentioned is what I will call the RNS ambitwister string, string by uh, David and Lionel. Sorry. And uh, what you can see here is that what I wanted to take away is that this is really a chiral world key theory. Everything is chiral, including what I've hidden here in SM, the world key matter. Now, I've kept this quite vague because this actually captures a big class of theories. Um, but for gravity, so type 2 supergravity, which I've spelled out here, we have two fermions, which gives it the name RNS. Note that both of these are chiral, so there's no, there's no left and right moving, everything is left moving in this theory. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight for you is that we'll always have an integral over a Riemann surface here, never a super Riemann surface, even for type 2 supergravity. So um, instead, the supersymmetry comes entirely from a world heat supergroup, super gauge group. Okay, so why do we call this an ambitwister string? If we, if we focus on just the bosonic piece here that I've spelled out explicitly, we can see that it seems to map naturally into the cotan bundle with T and X, um, space-time indices indicated here. Um, and we have this additional Lagrange multiplier constraint, E tilde over 2 P square, that tells us that really we're putting P square equals zero, and after quantization, we're also quotienting by P dot DX. Now that tells us that the target space, instead of being the cotangent space, is more properly actually the space of non geodesics. And this is something that we've seen several times coming up that this is some that is this massively simplifies descriptions of massless field theories. Now this is very intuitive because of course massless particles travel along non geodesics, so it's intuitively at least clear that this might give something uh, more simple or give rise to more simple amplitude descriptions. Now, one of the key features of this is that the, cor that the correspondence between ambitwister space and space time is actually non-local. So in particular, a point in ambitwister space, as we define it here, is a null geodesic, so just a light ray in complexified space time. And the opposite way around, points correspond to projective quadrix in ambitwister space. Now, this is, if you want, the vectorial representation, but at least in, in 4D, what started this whole off, is that we know that there is actually an, a different representation of this, a spinorial one. Um, and uh, this is, I'll call it the twister representation for the following reason, and it's also what gives the name to, ambi -twister, to the ambi-twister string. Now, we have... In 4D, we can write ambitwister space as the space of twisters and dual twisters Z and W. And the incidence relation tell us, tells us that a twister Z corresponds to a totally null two plane in space time. And similarly, W, the dual twister, corresponds to an anti self dual two plane. Now, generically, they don't intersect. But it turns out that if they, if they do intersect, they do so along a null ray, which I've called L here. And this happens precisely when Z dot W is zero. So that means we have an alternative description, at least in 4D, in terms of those two twister and dual twister variables, uh, just as a quadric inside T cross T star. Now, as you probably well know, this means that in addition to the RNS ambitwister string, at least in 4D, 
what we can do is write down, well, that's the original, I've done this completely against the chronological order, the Berkowitz Witten, for example, twister string, um, where I've just lifted the context structure and pulled it back to the world sheet sigma here. And this is, just gives you this, and then an additional Lagrange multiplier constraint, z.w, enforces the target space uh, quadric that we've seen on the last slide. Now, in light of this, so let me just mention the two have obviously obviously talked to each other. They know about each other. And in particular, if you calculate formulas in the RNS amateur string, you get the, the so-called CHY formulas that give you the amp one of the amplitude representation I was referring to. And on the other hand, if you calculate in D equals four in the twistorial ambitrister string, you end up with the RSVW or the CS for gravity formula. Now these two, you can take agree in four dimensions. Now that leads us naturally to the question, is this twistorial representation that has a lot of, go a lot of things going for it for us? So for example, it's manifestly supersymmetric. Um, does this only happen in four and 10 dimensions? Or are there nice descriptions in other dimensions? And so what I want to talk about today is what happens in five and six dimensions. And what we'll see is that there is a intuitively quite similar ambitrous the string model. And we'll see what is special about six and five dimensions that makes this work nicely. OK, so just as a short warm up, let me remind you about spina helicity in six dimensions, because as, as we've seen, so for super sim manifest supersymmetry of a twisters, it's clear that we will use this extensively. And so in six dimensions, um, we still have an uh, isomorphism provided by the gamma matrices for, for vectors in Minkowski space. So we will use this to write vectors as with two indices, in this case, both in both wild spina indices A, B, and uh, yeah. So a general vector can always be written as anti-symmetric as K, A, B with anti-symmetric indices. And we can raise and lower indices naturally with the metric, which in this case is just the natural epsilon on SL4. Now, if K is now uh, our vector here, then we actually obtain a very nice spina description that has the spina helicity description that has been, for example, discussed by Cliff and Donald. Um, because when k squared is zero, k actually reduces rank to just rank two. And so we can decompose it into two uh, fundamental or anti fundamental spinners with an additional little group index. And I will often denote contractions in something that is resembling a four denotation. But note that these are here little group contractions. Now, let me just mention this extends to very nice, uh, a very nice encoding for the polarization data. And for momentum eigenstates and after equations of motion, this boils down to the fact that all the polarization data for a field can be encoded just in a spinner, in a little group spinner. OK, after this warm up, uh, let's have a look at twister space for this for six dimensional Minkowski space. Now, in any dimension, we can define pure spin uh, twisters as pure spinners for the conformal group. So, in this case, for SO8, we just have uh, a, a fundamental and anti fundamental wild spinner. And purity tells us that z dot z has to be zero. Now, very similarly to what happens in four dimensions, the incidence relation in this case. Uh, tells us that X corresponds to a CP3 in twister space and the opposite way around that if we fix a twister, then that corresponds to a totally null self dual three plane, which we still call an alpha plane. Now in 60, that means we can actually repeat something that is very reminiscent of the 4D construction to obtain the space of light rays, uh, which is as follows. Now, in 60, two alpha planes generically don't intersect, but if they do, they also intersect along a null ring. So I've highlighted this here by keeping the same color to remind you that now both Z1 and Z2 are twisters. And just as in 4D, the, the 
or well, in, in an analog to what happens in 4D, the requirement for two alpha planes intersecting is that the corresponding twisters z1 dot z2 uh, dot to zero, where the dot product is defined as above. Now, if you look at this for a second, you realize that this actually has a very nice geometric interpretation, namely that if you construct a line z1 plus u z2, where u is just a complex parameter, then the whole line has to lie in twisters. So that gives us a very nice geometric interpretation of ambi-twister space in 6D as a space of lines and twister space. Now, just by being familiar with the 4D models, for example, that is completely enough to lift this or to pull this back to a wall sheet action. So we can propose a chiral wall sheet model where we've just used the contact structure on the space pulled back to the wall sheet and we're gauging the additional symmetries that restrict us to the space of lines. Um, if, that's, if that's not what you want to be doing, uh, let me also tell you that this matches at least the bosonic sector uh, for the RNS and the twister string. If you use the P is lambda lambda and the incidence relation. So you can also make uh, the contact more directly. Now this is anomaly free, meaning the SL2 gauge anomaly vanishes and you can cancel uh, the central charge anomaly to include another current algebra completely internal of weight uh, of C equals 40. So for example, that is something that would typically lead to bio-joint scalar models. And indeed, just as we expect, the bio-joint scalar actually shows up in the spectrum, but it turns out that there's a lot of other states in the spectrum. So it does also contain a higher order conformally invariant gauge and gravity theory. Now you completely expect that this is conformally invariant because we started out with uh, a representation of the conformal group, and we did nothing to break the conformal invariance. Uh, but it would be really nice to actually investigate these states further and see, for example, if they match with the work of uh, Henrik and friends. Now, I just want to give you a vague idea for the structure of these vertex operators, um, because they have a very nice course, it's a very nice interplay between the CFT and uh, traditional uh, ambi-twister theory for the following reason. Uh, ambi-twister space, just as twister space, has a nice correspondence between fields on space-time and, in this case, cohomology classes on uh, ambi-twister space. Now, in twister space, this, is, this gives you the equation of motion. Note that on ambi-twister space, this is an off-shell correspondence. So actually, a lot of the traditional ambi-twister uh, theory was focused on whether they can obtain uh, the equations of motion for this. Now it turns out that in the CFT, this comes about as quantum consistency conditions. So for example, for the RNS vertex operator, we find that it takes the form of del bar k dot t e to the i k dot x for a momentum eigenstate. Now if we want to lift this to the twistorial model, one way to do this is to use this binaural resolution for the momentum p that we had from the correspondence between the RNS and the twistorial model. So if you remember that p is lambda lambda, then the constraint delta bar k dot t that appeared in the RNS vertex operator, you can see that now this takes the form that the determinant of kappa, where kappa is the spinner for the particle, and lambda has to vanish. Or in other words, up to a little group rotation, uh, lambda and kappa are the same. Now, there's some freedom for normalization. And what we'll see, hopefully, if we have time for this, is that the path integral uh, completely localizes lambda in a similar way to how this happens in the RNS and the twister string. And indeed, this guarantees you, after all, that this matches with the RNS. Now, after all that is said and done, the vertex operators takes a Okay, it fills the line, but it's a, a remarkable, sim remarkably simple form with just the one constraint over here, the normalization sitting out front, and the exponential matching directly the e to the i k dot x using the incidence relation. And you can actually make this explicit and show that the two up to this w, which is uh, a part that comes from the world sheet meta systems that we've included, completely match between the two. So 
if you want all the details are in that w there now let me just mention briefly that i've actually just i made a choice here that i didn't inform you about so that i i just told you about the ambi twister representation using twisters i could have completely equivalently using uh, so8 triality uh, use the opposite plurality if you want some tilde twisters that I've now called y. Sorry, this is there's a typo here. This should be opposite index structures. Um, and I've highlighted that in green here. And also notice that I've included here the opposite little group structure. Now, there's a third model which uses the embedding description. And in all of these, we will find ambi twister space as the space of lines of a six quadrant. Um, let me not go into details on the embedding space description and just say that it reduces, at least for the biogiant scalar, to the CHY formulas in the end. Now, the two twisted descriptions, though, are also on a very similar footing. We but want just to remind you five minutes now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in that case, let me, let me speed this up a bit. Um, so why the two are important is that you have, if you, so far, I haven't actually told you anything in a QCD meets gravity meeting about Jan Mills or gravity, except for some higher order theories. So you could reasonably ask, what about Jan Mills and gravity in these 60 theories? So it turns out that both of those are quite hard to get in 60. And the reason is quite simple, um, because we know from the RNS models that we expect maximal supersymmetry. But in 60, maximal supersymmetry is ambidextrous. And so we absolutely expect to have to include both the if you want the chiral and the antichiral model. And uh, that is something that means you will have to deal with additional constraints that are quite hard to formulate and will probably include some ghost for ghost system. So instead of going into all of this mess that we don't know how to do in a 20 minute talk, let me tell you how to do it easier, which is doing it in five minutes. Now, luckily for me, because the time is running quite short, the reduction to 5D is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, which is as follows. We just choose a vector that is pointing in a non-null direction. And then we just reduce to 5D by requiring the momenta to lie in the 5 direction, so to be orthogonal to that vector omega. And we identify hypersurfaces along translations on omega. Now, in ambitwister space, this is really easily implemented. The uh, orthogonality constraint to omega just gives you that Lamp, the lambda is zero and notice that I've secretly now used omega just to index object to raise and lower indices. So this gives me uh, a natural object with which to do that. Now, uh, we also have to quotient by the translations uh, that identifies these hypersurfaces, but that is really easy either directly via incidence relations or to see the, from the from what this current generates a Hamiltonian flow. And then in the ambi twister string, the only thing we have to do is implement this directly via a Lagrange multiplier. Now, to actually get to uh, gauge theory and gravity, what we have to do is we have to include two more objects. One is completely expected. We have to boost our ambi twisters to super ambi twisters. And that is fairly straightforward. We just use the natural supersymmetric extension. And so for all of our purposes, this will just include additional fermionic variable eta here. And the reduction to 5D works just as in the bosonic case. The other thing that we need is some sort of system that actually tells us that this is either gravity or young Mills theory, something resembling the, the psi fermions in the RNS model. And it turns out that the correct system is this row row tilde system that I've included here. And notice crucially that this is not an internal system. It couples to the super twisters via these um, Lagrange, fermionic Lagrange multipliers chi. Um, also, let me just highlight briefly, this is again a world sheet supergroup. So it, it doesn't promote you to a super Riemann surface, but it's just a gauge supergroup that we're gauging here. Okay, with all of this, we arrive at three critical models. One is for supergravity, where we include two of these row systems. One is for super young mills with one row system and one current algebra correlator. And one includes, one is the 
by a joint scalar system from before, which obviously for no supersymmetry still can be incorporated in 5D in this method. Let me mention that anomaly free, I've cheated here a bit with the action. This is only anomaly free if we include a free current algebra that comes from the reduction from 10D where all of these models naturally want to live to 5D. And finally, since this is QCD meets gravity, let me, let me highlight that with the color coding, what we've done here is that the double copy is very manifest here at the level of the world peak between maximal supergravity and maximal superabundance. Okay, in view of time, let me just tell you that the, what the correlators do is produce some of the known amplitudes formula with manifest supersymmetry, and maybe highlight that this comes about in a fairly standard and straightforward way, but without giving you any of the details. Um, instead, in the last probably two minutes or so that I have, let me just tell you that even if you don't care about 4D, why you should why you could possibly still care about this, um, it gives you a very natural mechanism to obtain a, a model for the 4D massive formulas that have been written down. So all of these come about from symmetry reductions from higher dimensions, otherwise these models can't handle it. Um, and the advantage of having a model underlying this is that in contrast to just writing down the amplitudes, what this model makes very clear in the end is that all the amplitudes factorize correctly and have all the correct properties on every propagator structure. The other point that I briefly want to mention is some connection with uh, the recent one loop formula written down by Sanka and, and friends, um, that a further reduction allows you to write down a nodal operator, a uh, nodal operator in the sense of Kai Rurik and David Skinner, where, you, where the CFT naturally has a non-local operator that you can write down and that gives you the one loop uh, uh, integrands to be honest um, after integrating over the loop momentum in, in the sense of degeneration of the handler operators in the string theory. Now this was very uh, be, be barely a sketch but I hope this convinces you at least that there's something even in 40 that could be done with this. So we are minus minutes now so Okay, um, in that case, let me just uh, put this up uh, without, uh, without summary because it's on the slide and maybe just mention that there's uh, a whole couple of further directions where this could be taken. So for example, these row row tilde systems are something that show up both in 4D and in 6D in very similar or reminiscent formats. And it would be very interesting to see or to understand where these are actually coming from rather than reverse engineering them from knowing the amplitudes and see, for example, how they could make contact with the RNS model. And I think I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, any questions for Ivan? Nice talk. I see Lance has still a hand up. Max? Yep. Um, I have a question for Yvonne. Nice talk. Um, I would like to know why you are requiring that the spinners describing the momentum PA has to be the same. I mean, in principle, in the four-dimensional twister string, you have lambda and lambda bar, right? So why now you are... Tilde, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So why you don't do something like that, for example, for 6D or 5D? Well, first of all, I mean, in, in 60, at least, let me just go back to the very first slide uh, that discusses 60. Um, so actually, you already know this is going to happen here. So this is just this that comes down to just what the gamma matrices in this case look like. And it tells you that you write a vector as uh, a two index object, but both of them are in the same representation, either fundamental or anti-fundamental. So in particular, that means momenta become just kappa A, kappa B, or if you want to call these tilde, you can, but they either both upper or lower indices and not as in 4D, uh, alpha and alpha dot, completely different indices in different groups. Um, you can see this, for example, by a basic counting. So it's completely clear that this two index object, just see that uh, this runs from zero to three, uh, my indices, um, it's anti-symmetric and it has to be anti-symmetric to encode 
uh, six degrees of freedom. So okay, okay, I see. Easy way to see this. Okay, okay, N nice, thanks. Any other questions, comments? So the connection to CHY is also very nice, but you didn't mention it in the summary. Sorry, um, so it's, it's, you can show that the formulas that come out of these um, give ne just match directly the CHY formulas that you would obtain by uh, reducing dimensions. And at least for the bosonic factor, that's something that you can prove. Um, to do it at the level of the path integral is much harder. So at the level of the path integral, I would love to know how to do it, but I don't think anyone knows even in 4D how to do this properly at the level of the path integral. Um, oh. But sorry, if you, uh, if you do this whole correlator, what you find is a 60 representation for super young Milson supergravity that you can match at least in the bosonic sector directly to CH1. Oh, okay. 